Welcome back to Minute Mythology's Week of the Dragon. In Dungeons & Dragons 5th Edition, the green dragons are often described as the third most powerful of all chromatic dragons, and were known for being manipulative and cunning creatures who were far more patient than their fellow chromatic dragons, and could therefore spend years or even centuries creating and carrying out plots to corrupt and destroy their targets. They were known to collect hordes of treasure like any other dragon, but they reveled in their ability to corrupt and destroy the lives of mortals, inevitably enslaving them or destroying them when their mind games became boring. Being slightly smaller and weaker physically, the green dragons preferred to stalk their prey and gain as much information about them as possible. They were willing to take the diplomatic approach with enemies they viewed as a tangible threat, but their draconic temper would eventually outweigh this careful approach, and would always result in a violent attack. They make their lairs in forests where they could twist the plant life into a veritable maze covered in thick fog and an acrid poisonous air that wafts over everything. Though this sometimes put them at odds with black dragons who are at home in marshes, the the green dragons were typically deep enough in a forest to avoid conflict, living in secluded caves or beneath natural water areas where they could hide the entrance to their lair. Within their lair, the plant and animal life would become enslaved by its power. Birds and rodents would become its spies, and the plants would grow and shift to allow it passage, and to hinder the passage of outsiders. This allows the green dragon to toy with any adventurers that come into its domain, while also leaving no trace of its own movements. Unless, of course, it wants them to know where it's going. The adult and ancient green dragons have a flight speed of 80 and a ground or swimming speed of 40. They have amazing stats, sporting a slightly higher intellect and charisma than some of the other dragons. They're trained in deception, insight, persuasion, stealth, and perception, making them masters of manipulation with the ability to move unseen. They have three legendary resistances per day and can use a multi-attack consisting of their frightful presence, plus one bite attack and two claws. Alternatively, they can also strike out with their tail as a full action, though this is kind of a waste. Their main weapon is their breath weapon, a 90-foot cone that prompts a DC 22 con save, which if failed results in 22 to 132 poison damage. Like other ancient dragons, the green dragon also has three legendary actions it can use at the end end of another creature's turn. They can detect, make a free tail attack, or for two out of three of the actions they can make a wing attack that deals decent damage and can knock players prone. A green dragon's lair actions revolve around crowd control instead of outright damage. The dragon can choose a 20-foot section of the lair to erupt in vines, restraining creatures caught and turning the area into difficult terrain. The dragon can also create a massive wall of thorns similar to the wall of fire spell, dealing damage and creating a line of sight breaking barrier that costs extra movement and damage to get through. Finally, the dragon can summon a mystical fog prompting a DC 15 wisdom save that, if failed, charms the player until the next lair action turn, effectively taking them out of the fight for a whole round. As a DM, I would always have the dragon fighting in its lair if possible, as outside of the lair, the fight is not going to be as exciting or dangerous. For green dragons, I would have them stalking the players either personally, or by using vermin and birds within the radius of their lair, learning who they are, what their goals are, and most importantly, who are the most dangerous should a fight break out. I would have the dragon's lair lead them around in circles, whittling away at their HP with small encounters and thorns. If the players eventually find the dragon's lair, I would have placed it behind a waterfall fall, or in a cavern beneath a water structure like a lake, so as to slow their progress and also prevent an easy, non-magical escape route. Once they're within the lair, I would use the first lair action to summon the giant wall, cutting the arena in half, with melee stuck with the dragon on one side, where the spellcasters and ranged players cannot target them. For future lair actions, I would swap between the Charm Cloud and the Grasping Roots, as both can be used to single out a target and prevent melee specifically from reaching the dragon, while also keeping them in breath attack range and the range of most other attacks. I would use the breath attack to strike as many players as possible on every turn it's available. Whenever it isn't available, I would use the multi-attack to strike a single player that is not being affected by the charm or difficult terrain. At the end of the first non-dragon turn, I would always be using the wing attack to harm players and knock them prone, further decreasing their mobility and their health. I would save the third legendary action per round for a tail attack, just in case melee players are getting too close. Should the dragon feel like it's losing the fight, I would use another wall action to block its escape route, and then have it swim or fly away from the lair to return another day, or to stalk the players from afar, hoping to catch them in a moment of weakness later on. As with all dragons, 
dragons, the modern depiction and physicality of the D&D green dragon has its roots in European lore and mythology, but the green dragons are clearly being inspired by a combination of the previously mentioned azure dragons in Chinese mythology, and the green dragons of Celtic and ancient Britain lore. The azure dragons in Chinese lore are associated with the east, wind, and nature, and the Celtic green dragons are often seen as symbols of power, sovereignty, and leadership, with the pendragon being a Celtic descriptor or moniker for a chieftain or king, and the eye of the dragon being a phrase referring to the taking of power. In Ireland specifically, the whole earth is described by Celtic druids as the body of a great green dragon, similar in many ways to the Turtle Island creation stories of indigenous peoples in North America. Stone circles and other fonts of ritualistic power were built on what the ancient druids believed were the power nodes of a dragon's body, and the green dragons in myth were often considered to be the ultimate protectors of nature, and a connector between mortals and the healing powers of nature itself. Beyond Celtic lore, many religions and belief systems use the color green to symbolize power, healing, nature, and a spiritual connection as well as freedom and balance in all things. This is why when we compare the green dragon of various mythological backgrounds to the D&D monster, we find that the D&D variant is simply an amalgamation of representations that has been warped and corrupted. Instead of being bastions of faith, healing, freedom, or nature, the green dragons of D&D are selfish and vain creatures who bend the force to their evil will, enslaving creatures and corrupting the very earth they walk on. Their very breath is poison, and instead of protecting nature, they use it to further their own evil goals, forcing that which was once in perfect harmony to be warped into a weapon of evil. If you enjoyed that video, please leave a like and comment below, and consider subscribing to the channel. You can also join the Patreon for $1 a month to access videos days before they're posted here, as well as other exclusive stuff like short stories, videos, and more.